I'm going to go through, you know, it's, it's, it's several stories in the book, and, and uh, I think I'm going to look largely at the deep history of the landscape and the future of the landscape. And let me just start. First, I'm going to give a shout out to my daughter, Erica. When I started the, uh, got close to the publishing time, I said, Erica, how about I do some drawings for the book to help add an artistic touch? So she did 13 uh, drawings of wildlife that graced the pages and it, beginning and end of chapters. So uh, that was a lot of fun to have her involved. And the book is largely bo broken down into three sections. The first section is really from the deep history, and I'll show you that, on through to the recent history of, of the landscape out here. The core of the book is about the wildlife population collapses and the recoveries. And that core of the book, I think the things that you've learned a lot about the last few years in your visioning uh, effort, you've heard a lot about the importance of this region for wildlife uh, conservation and what it could look like when we bring it all back. So I'm not gonna talk about that a whole lot. I'm gonna skip over that and look largely at the context of how the land evolved and has been used that affected the wildlife. And then the last chapter is a look to the future. So just again, make sure you're oriented. Here's the Northern Great Plains, the Northern Great Plains ecoregion. Back 25 years ago, World Wildlife Fund declared this as a global priority because of its importance for grassland conservation. And uh, the project area is what, of course, we refer to here. In, it's about an eight county region in Northeast Montana. And you can see it's part of the Great Plains region. So here's what it looks like from about 200 miles up uh, from Google Earth. Just to make sure everybody is oriented, you are right here, number one, Lewistown. Here's Antelope Creek Campground, Enrico, Malta, of course, Missouri River, and the Milk River. So that's what it looks like today. Now, I want to step back. The reason I step back to look at the deep history is, at least my analogy is it's just like going into a historic house. If you don't know the history of it, you don't really know the house. If you just look at the static point of where it is today. So I think understanding the deep history of how this place evolved develops a bigger appreciation for what there is. And this is what it looked like 360 million years ago. That's because it was under an ocean. About, uh, and it had some wild looking creatures, but the important creatures in terms of today were the plankton, because they fell out and they created the Bakken Shield where you get shale, oil, and gas today. That's important today. Luckily, the project area right here is not part of that Bakken formation where all the drilling is going on, but economically it has a significant influence on Glasgow, Malta, the region. But even when we, looked at the location of the American Prairie, we decided, good, it's outside that oil and gas development area. So that historic 360 million years ago has a big influence yet today on the region. Another thing that I thought in terms of starting about this point is that we still have things on the landscape that are visible from 340 million years ago. This is the little Rocky Mountains if you cross over Highway 191 over the Missouri River heading north, you see the Little Rockies. They came up about 50 million years ago, a magma dome. And this formation is from 340 million years ago. It got pushed up on its edge as the dome came up through the, uh, the limestone. That's highly visible. It's important today as nesting sites for golden eagles, prairie falcons, all kinds of wildlife. So again, part of the landscape from millions of years ago is important today. Then when we jump ahead about 300 million years, I gotta move fast, it's about 10 million years per minute. Um, is uh, we've got, this is the most important place on the planet for T-Rex, Triceratops, there's no place like it. We're in a rich, rich fossil area. You can walk around out there and find fossils. I have to, and, and I should point out about 75 million years ago, we were right 
sitting right here on the edge of, a sh of the Western Interior Seaway. It was a subtropical forest, marshlands. This place was entirely different. Running around, I said, wildlife watching here would have been really dangerous 75 million years ago. This is, I love this depiction. The only problem is, this looks like a grassland, doesn't it? Grasslands didn't come around for another 20 million years. So a slight problem. Uh, one of the uh, most famous dinosaurs from here is Leonardo. Leonardo was discovered, I think, in the year 2000 near Malta. It's a duckbill uh, dinosaur. It's the best preserved dinosaur in existence in the world. And just in July, Damien, as chair of the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum, accompanied Leonardo to a museum in Japan. So we have dinosaurs still as ambassadors to American Prairie. And that's the, uh, the installation in Japan. Damien says the, uh, the museum is fantastic. But you don't have to be a professional paleontologist to find fossils out here. This is on the transect that we all took, a bunch of us took in 2015. There's Susan right there in the middle and my wife Heather. Heather picked up a, picked up a um, a concretion, and um, uh, Denver Fowler, right here, who's a paleontologist, he said, well, some of these concretions have interesting fossils, usually they don't. So I cracked it open, and there's a fossil lobster in the middle of the concretion. But then, about 66, 66 million years ago, all hell broke loose. This is an asteroid traveling about six to 10 miles in diameter, you know the story, traveling about 12 miles per second, struck the Yucatan Peninsula, made a crater about 100 miles wide, 10 to 12 miles deep, and even though we're 2,000 miles away here, the effects were felt. First was the earthquake, then a tsunami, then molten glass was ejected into the atmosphere, started raining down here, here, you can find it in the gills of fossil fish. And that heat burned the forest here. And then after the forest fire and all the soot that went in the atmosphere, we had the impact winter where there was virtually no photosynthesis on Earth. And so it was devastating. And of course, it wiped out the dinosaurs, all dinosaurs except birds. And the birds su survived, obviously. And because you got rid of all these big dinosaurs, we had explosive evolution of mammals in this region. Mammals were cut loose evolutionarily. But one of the first mammals to appear just 100,000 years after the end Cretaceous extinction of dinosaurs was a, a, a species called Purgatorius, about that big, shrew-like. It may have been the very first primate, our ancestor, may have got to start right here. It's called Purgatorius because it's found in Purgatory Hill, not too far east of here. So it's, uh, it may be, even though Africa may be the birthplace of humans, we're the birthplace of primates, perhaps. And then uh, quickly, within 45, 45 million years ago, mammals increased in size by a thousand times. So you this explosion of evolution, and you had some really great looking creatures like uh, the uh, thunder beast here, the first predators, creodont. This, this was entelodont, also known as the hell pig. That thing's as big as a bison, if you can imagine that on the landscape. And they roamed around out here. Moving ahead, by about five to 10 million years ago, grasslands now are spreading. Again, there were no grasslands here 55 million years ago. Slowly, grasses evolved and began to kick out the forest as the climate got drier here in the Great Plains. And what's interesting is mammals went through a whole bunch of evolutionary changes. So when you look at grassland mammals out here, just remember, they adapted to the grasslands. The rodents became colon uh, colony makers and burrowers. Uh, long legs were evolved. Ungulates learned to run on their toenails, their hooves. And wolves, rather than plantigrade, the flat, bear-like paw, wolves started running on their fingertips. They were faster, so they could pursue 
faster prey. And ungulates, like bison and so on, grew into big herds. And because you could see around as a bull, you could control more females, presumably, and so you had larger harems by ungulates. So anyway, all these adaptations that we see on these grassland mammals. And then about two, six million years ago, the start of the Ice Age, um, and ice sheets came down, the continental ice sheets, and uh, probably humans came down the, the coastal route more than 20,000 years ago, 25,000 years ago, but there was also an interior place that opened up about 15,000 years ago between the Rocky Mountains and the Plains, and it dumped right out here into Montana. So we had all kinds of movement of people and wildlife that end up coming from, down from, from uh, the Bering Sea, uh, the Bering Strait, down to this part of Montana and the Great Plains. So we're right in the middle of all this movement of wildlife a mere 10, 15,000 years ago. Sorry about this complex map, but the idea I just wanted to point out is the, uh, the last two glaciers one came down about 160,000 years ago, the other about 20,000 years ago at their maximum extent. And when they came down, this is where the Missouri, this is the Missouri River. We're down here in Lewistown. Here's the Missouri. So they blocked the Missouri River and the Muscle Shell and created, for example, Lake Muscle Shell, huge lake. And the next photo is this taken about where this yellow square is. And that's uh, Damien. I mean, uh, Danny, standing by a glacial er erratic. This one probably broke off the ice sheet in an iceberg, floated across the lake, and then melted on the shore of the lake. And that's how you can tell where the edge of the lake was. You go out and survey where are these erratics got, that got dumped by the icebergs. The other one here is Indian Rock. You're familiar with that. That got dropped by a glacier just on the uh, western edge of of, uh, in, of the um, prairie, uh, Sun Prairie. And then down here is a third type. This is Snake Butte on the Indian, uh, Fort Belknap Indian Reservation. When the glacier came over top of this, it dumped off, it scraped the rocks off the top and dumped them six miles away. And one of the new properties you just got, Damien and, Arthur and I were out there a couple days ago, you got a bunch of these strewn across your new property. So it's fascinating, again, uh, aspect of the landscape. And of course the glaciers were important, the ice sheets for gouging out wetlands. Uh, the, the whole, the northern part of our region is, is covered in prairie potholes and wetlands. The other thing I'll just mention that the ice sheets did, the last ice sheet, the Missouri River used to run in the Milk River. And the last ice sheet pushed it down 40 miles to its current course not only that, here's where the ice sheet was probably right here, and finally Lake Muscle Shell filled up enough that it finally broke through and carved a new pathway through the, uh, the Larb Hills here to create this L in the UL Bend Wilderness. So anyway, all these things on the landscape that you can appreciate the effect of the last ice sheet. Oh, the last thing, that ice sheet brought down glacial till. And in fact, it's called the, so the SCOBY uh, oil, uh, soil, which is, who knew this, the Montana state soil. And, <laughs> and uh, it's highly productive. You can grow wheat on it. That's why the wheat fields north of Great Falls are there, not south of the river. It's highly, so it's had, an, an, again, an economic effect that we see today. So again, at the end of the Pleistocene, we've got this extinction. 70% uh, of, uh, more than 70% of North American mammals went extinct, but the bison escaped extinction and became the main prey of Native Americans. And about 10,000 years ago, most of the species are in place, and they haven't changed much since. But then, I'm sorry about this graph. This is in the last chapter. 24 species of wildlife collapsed. By collapse, I mean a 90% collapse once Euro-Americans arrived on the landscape. And I'll, again, like I said, I'm not going to go into details of this. You've, 
you probably learned more about this than other things, but uh, 14 species of mammal collapsed. This one's underappreciated. This is the Rocky Mountain locust that used to have its permanent place right here in Montana before it would swarm out across the Great Plains and devastate everything. It was equivalent to the bison in terms of its ecological effects. It eventually went extinct, however, for unknown causes after the arrival of Euro-Americans. But it was a force. And I didn't know they had photoshopping capabilities in 1880, but, <laughs> but the, last, the last two live ones were collected in, what was it, 19, I think, 1902 in Manitoba. Never seen again. They may exist in the non-migratory phase, maybe in Yellowstone Park in a, in a meadow, but uh, that's another story. You can read about it in chapter nine. Here's the pallid sturgeon. You may not know much about it either. It's a big river fish. It, this is probably, they get a little bit larger than this. And uh, the last wild, repro last reproduction in the wild was probably more than 60 years ago. That's because dams in the Missouri River have blocked its migration for spawning and reproduction. Right now, they're entirely dependent on hatchery-born fish. And then finally, eight species of birds that I think have collapsed by more than 90% that are discussed in one of the chapters from the sage grouse, burrowing owl, uh, mountain plover, lark bunting, and so on. So I want to go through now quickly the recent history of this region. Again, just uh, for orient orientation, we are here, Antelope Creek, Enrico, Malta, you recognize the landscape. Let's take a look. 10,000 to 500 years ago, all indigenous lands, native wildlife is entirely intact. There's no zero, apparently, Euro-American influence. About 1,500 to 1,800, I'll just switch the years now, 1,500 to 1,800, it's all indigenous lands, yet all native wildlife is intact. However, the first epidemics arrived well before Euro-Americans set foot here. Smallpox ran ahead and began to devastate Native American populations. And the horse arrived already in the, by the mid-1700s here from the south, Spanish horses. And guns got here ahead of Lewis and Clark as well. So you already have three influences of Euro-American colonization before the first footsteps were made here. And so this made a, the horse, of course, made a huge transition from a pedestrian way of life to an equestrian way of life. Now, rather than the dog being the biggest beast of burden, you had horses. Horses, of course, changed entirely the ability to hunt bison, and horses plus guns changed warfare. Now you could move much greater distances, and horses became something worth fighting over. One of the results of this is a buffer zone. When Lewis and Clark came through, there is a large buffer zone because of warring between the tribes, between the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River, 100 miles to the south. Lewis and Clark even commented the yeah, wildlife was abundant here because Native Americans were afraid to hunt in this buffer zone. So the wildlife flourished. And remember reports of... Uh, of, uh, for example, Lewis, I think it was, going up to a wolf and virtually being able to spear it without even getting too close. So that was a big influence already of, of warring between the tribes that may have been facilitated by the horse and firearms. And then 1800, 1825, Lewis and Clark, of course, came through in 1805. Within a year of Lewis and Clark getting back to St. Louis, beaver trappers are up here. They wasted no time getting at the beaver and the river otter. Uh, it's still on all indigenous lands, however, and there's no livestock except the horses now here owned by Native Americans. Then we go to 1825 to 1850. Fort Benton, as a trading post, has now been established on the upper Missouri River. Uh, beaver and uh, otter fur trade has ended already. We trapped the beaver out. They're gone in the otter. Uh, and, 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 and the hats for beaver hats in Europe were no longer so popular. All indigenous lands yet, only horses here. Fort Benton's established. Then we go up to 1850, 1875, still all indigenous lands. 
market for bison hides has, burst, uh, has opened up, so much more bison hunting. Most of the native wildlife is still intact, only the horse here, but steamships are now going up the Missouri River to Fort Benton, and it's a tough ride on a steamship. The steamships created problems. You can imagine that's when the grizzly bear and, uh, and bighorn sheep, which often are along the river, probably began to be depleted. And of course, shooting bison from the steamships was, was a favorite sport of passengers, if you can imagine. And it also created what's called the Woodhawk Wars. So the steamships took 25 to 30 cords of wood a day, depleting the forest along the river, but Native Americans used the forest for hunting game, for heat, for shelter. They fed cottonwood leaves to the horses. So there are a series of wars between Native Americans and the woodhawks. And the woodhawks, during the, uh, when they weren't uh, providing wood for the steamboats, were hunting wolves uh, for the fur market. This is Sitting Bull's camp along the uh, Missouri River. 1875 to 1900, livestock have now replaced. This is the fastest transition from wild ungulates to livestock probably in the history of the world. In 1880, it was virtually all, we had herds of 50 to 80,000 bison out here yet. By 1886, hardly a bison left, and there were more than 50 livestock companies incorporated in eastern Montana with money from the east coast in Europe, the open range era of livestock. The railroad reaches eastern Montana, Fort Belknap, Fort Peck, Indian reservations established. Towns of Malta, Glasgow, and Lewistown have started. The last locusts have reported in Montana, and a bounty now is on wolves and cougars because we have livestock here. Here's a hunter with big wolves in, in the middle. I think the others are coyotes. 1900 to 1925, Rocky Boys Indian Reservation is established. Wolf, cougar, and grizzly bear are gone, hunted to extinction. At the peak of the bounty season in this region, 1,500 wolves a year were bounty. This is where wolves were super abundant. Uh, the homestead boom and bust, it came and it went. The Enlarged Homestead Act of 1909 finally brought homesteaders to eastern Montana. That lasted until 1920 when the market fell for prices uh, prices of grain because of the end of World War I, among other reasons, and, and half the homesteaders lost their land. Um, so it was a boom and bust, but it was the first big plow up of Native Prairie with the homesteaders that came in. One of them was uh, Rosie Rosalind, right here. 18% of the homesteaders making claims were single women. And so this is not necessarily an unusual photo. This is in Prairie County, just to, the west, just to the east of here. 1925, 1950, because of the depression and the destitute farmers, we had the largest buyback of land by the US government in the United States, more than a million acres right here, purchased back to rescue destitute farmers. The Taylor Grazing Act then, in 1933, regulated grazing, and that was the end of homesteading, finally, putting some order to the land out here, stopping homesteading, trying to control grazing. Prairie dog poisoning campaign in the 20s and 30s wiped out the prairie dog, wiped out the black-footed ferret, probably the swift fox, and a number of other species. And finally, the C.M. Russell Refuge and Bodoin Refuges were created in 1936. And in 1940, the Fort Peck Dam was completed. There's the Fort Peck Dam, biggest earthen dam at one point, employed 10,500 people to construct it. And in the process, flooding what was surely some of the most outstanding riverine habitat along the Missouri River in the entire stretch. I can't imagine what that used to look like. And I can't wait until someday that dam is gone. And then uh, 1950 and 1975, Three more dams in the upper Missouri. That has changed, reduced the peak flow of the Missouri down through here by 40 to 50 percent with a lot of effects on the river, on cottonwood regeneration. Uh, we need to reestablish these peak flows because that's what made the Missouri so dynamic. In some places, the Missouri is now, the channel 
is 100 yards more narrow because we don't have these peak flows. Elk and bighorn sheep have been reintroduced, which is a step forward in the, rock, in the Missouri River breaks. And now we have the first bison on uh, Fort Belknap in uh, 1974, I think they were brought on. Now things really pick up in terms of conservation efforts underway in the region. Uh, the BLM now, because of the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, is required to also consider wildlife and recreation as part of their mandate. We have 12 new wilderness study areas. Upper Missouri River National uh, Wild and Scenic River is declared. Uh, Grasslands National Park, right across the border, on the border with Montana and Saskatchewan is created, about 180,000 acres now. The Blackfoot and Ferrets reintroduced on the CMR Refuge in 1994. Bison now are back in Fort Peck. Now we have two bison herds. And the Nature Conservancy has just purchased the Matador Ranch right here. So all the place is getting attention for its conservation importance. And then, of course, I can't skip over this. We hit 2001, and American Prairies <laughs> is created. And uh, that's another whole talk some other day. Um, but there have been some changes, such as the logo. This is from, if you read it right there, it's my lovely wife, Heather Bent, 2001, first t-shirt we produced. <laughs> I asked her if she still has that painting somewhere. She's got to do some digging. Uh, so now, 2000. One, when we for created American Prairie to 2023. Now, in 2001, the Upper Missouri River Breaks was created, thanks to Stephen Ambrose Tubbs taking uh, um, Babbitt down the, uh, the river, and then Clinton declared it just before leaving office. American Prairie now is the 460,000 acres. Also, then, importantly, 224 conservation easements out here, mostly by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, to protect the the, the wetlands of this region. That's a lot of land. It's really important protecting them. We've got ferrets and swift fox on Fort Belknap. Two days ago, I was lucky enough to be in Fort Belknap to help release uh, one of the swift fox that has been recently brought in. Now we have three new bison herds. So that's five bison herds in this region now. And we've got, I should say, but, in the last 20 years, we've had 2 million acres of grassland plowed up in the eight county region. So the threat, the killer threat, is still here, plowing up grasslands. I just step back to see how far we've come. This is a graph of the eight largest protected areas in the Great Plains. And as you can see, this is the current extent in the expanded extent this is American Prairie and the Charles M. Russell Wildlife Refuge. All the other protected areas, the next eight biggest, seven biggest, don't even add up to what we have. That's how significant the size of this landscape is compared to what we have elsewhere. And I can go down the list of Badlands National Park, Grasslands National Park, so on. Now, near future, we've got more land in the American Prairie. The Charles M. Russell Refuge now is working on getting bison on the refuge. We'll have six bison herds here. Now again, this isn't just a bison project, but they are a good indicator of what we can do. So I think about that, well that's great, we got six bison, it's ridiculous to have six separate bison herds. I think if we look a little bit further in the distant future, we gotta take a, 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 a quote from Keith Onney and and Glenn Plum, two leading bison conservationists in the country, in their recent book, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and Bison Restoration of the Great Plains, it said, a common public perception is that bison be along the, behind a fence, which was ridiculous. It's the only wild animal in the country. And it's our national mammal, and it's behind a fence. So that's got to change. And if, when it changes, not if, when it changes, we're going to have this. We're going to have those six bison herds, a binational, multi-jurisdictional landscape where we're co-managing six herds now as one. And not just bison, pronghorn, sage grouse, all the wildlife out there in this large landscape of which American Prairie is the core 
leading the way of how we think big and get back to a sensible way of managing this landscape. And I'll, my final point is we need more of these places in the Great Plains. One big reserve is not enough. We've got a tremendous diversity across the Great Plains, but yet grasslands in North America are the least protected biome we have. Only 2% is in protected areas. That's because we could easily colonize it with agriculture. Open the chute and you had grass. Right? You didn't have to cut down the forest, drain the swamps. It was easily colonized. So we've got a lot of work to do. Here's the Great Plains. Here's, of course, our project area. But we got all this land that needs protection. That's because, without going into the details, we've got at least 21 different kinds of ecosystems out there. And we're only working on one of the major ones here. But there's others that need protection. I mentioned here David Joukowsky, a professor at Clemson University. I like his quote. By setting a sweeping goal of connecting 3.2 million acres, American Prairie has reframed the scale at which conservation success is measured in the Great Plains. And that's true. Everybody is looking to this project. This is the scale at which we have to work. Uh, and again, the barriers, the threats to, to uh, wildlife are still there. Grassland conversion, the invasion of trees because we've stopped fires. Tree uh, fires are necessary to stop the invasion, especially in the southern Great Plains, and traditional cattle ranching. So how, the big question is how I can throw up a list here of ways we can create new protected areas. One is obviously philanthropy-driven protection like we're doing here. Federal land acquisition. It's not, like I said, a few years, many years ago, we, we purchased more than a million acres here. And there's a land and water conservation fund with 22 billion sitting in it right now. That's for land conservation. But Congress hasn't acted on it. Uh, we can repurpose 25 to 30 million area, acres of BLM and national grasslands. So they're not for cattle grazing. Rather, they're for conservation purposes. Obviously, the tribal lands, the tribes are ter doing a terrific job now, moving out ahead in terms of restoring bison, prairie dogs, ferrets, uh, tremendous progress by the tribes, and, uh, and wildlife-based private enterprises, like in somewhat like wild sky beef, right? In terms of ranchers saying, gee, wildlife makes sense in the landscape. Chris, I didn't know you were going to be here. Really. But I used one of your quotes. I hope it's OK. <laughs> and uh, it, it's, uh, you can read it. I won't read it. But Chris said it so well in terms of the scale of this project emboldening, emboldening others to think big. And it's hard, but it's getting done. Thank you, Chris, for that, for that quote. Finally, I'm going to end up with one other idea. And that is, it's called shifting baseline syndrome. 1995, a fisheries biologist by the name of Daniel Pauly said, he noticed that his fisheries, young fisheries biologist, had the wrong idea of what a native natural fish population looked like. Every generation thought what they were seeing was a natural state. And in fact, it was much depleted. And he called this the shifting baseline syndrome of what's natural. Uh, Academic psychologists, of course, had to rebrand it as environmental generational amnesia. But it's a phenomenon of lowered expectations with, in which each generation regards progressively poor natural world as normal. And that we, leads to ever weaker conservation goals. So here's what you grow up seeing in the Great Plains now, right? 98% of the Great Plains, you travel. This is what you see. This is, gets embedded in the head. Oh, this is what the Great Plains look like. On the other hand, I think we can cure shifting baseline syndrome with a place like American Prairie where they look at this. I should say these are kids from the Crow Indian Reservation uh, participating in American Prairie uh, session. So this is what we can re how we can reset this idea of what's needed and what's possible. And I'll end with 
a quote from George Horse Capture Jr. after he took somebody out here to the prairie in their first impression, I think he captured well this idea of amnesia that people have about what the prairie looks like. As he said, almost like they accidentally found something they didn't know they were looking for. And I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you.